Well, let me say one more thing in addition to what Brandon just said. All weekend I've gotten to meet people from our Rundle campus uh, who I've never gotten to meet before. And if that's you, I'd love to meet you. Say hi to you in the lobby. I'm always in the lobby after every single sermon. And I would love to, to hear how long you've been at Mosaic and all that good stuff. Um, let me jump into this. Something that has been trending in the past few years at university campuses around our, co- around our country is something called a safe space. A safe space. And if you're not familiar with the idea of a safe space, what it means is a physical space where people of a particular group, they all have something in common, a like or, or some common trait, something, uh, can gather. And in that physical space, no one under any circumstance is allowed to say, ask them any questions, say anything um, derogatory, or even challenge any of their views that this group holds in common together. It's called a safe space. Now, I don't like the idea of a safe space for several different reasons. One is I agree with the New York Times columnist Judith Judith Shulovitz, who said, well, the implication of a safe space is that everywhere else is unsafe, which is not true. But I think it actually treats people like babies. In fact, in doing research on this, I read about one university that had a guest speaker, and it wasn't even that controversial of a guest speaker, uh, but they set up a safe space for people who may be triggered or offended by this guest speaker. And here's what it said. The quote, the room was equipped with cookies, coloring books, bubbles, Play-Doh, calming music, pillows, blankets, and a video of frolicking puppies. (laughs) You know what that is? Daycare. That's what that is. Safe spaces are daycare. And here's my big problem philosophically. is the whole point of a university is there to challenge your ideas. It's for you to grow. It's for you to be exposed to new thoughts and and, uh, new forms of history and art and music and all of it so you can challenge the things you believe and challenge thoughts and learn what is ultimately true. And if you can't ask questions, you can't ultimately find truth. So I hate the idea of a university ever in any context being a place where you're not allowed to ask questions. And I get we need to be civil. We need to be nice. Can't be rude or belligerent for the sake of being rude or belligerent. That's not healthy. Um, But I don't like the idea of safe spaces because... The whole point of a university should be able to ask questions. Now, I know we have university professors in here. I know we have college students in here. Before you think I'm saying all this just to throw stones, the reason I bring up why I hate that you can't ask questions at university is because the church has been like that for a long time. So the way I was brought up, and I don't know if somebody along the line actually taught me this or if I just kind of inferred it and made it up myself, but I, brought, I was brought up with the understanding that questions regarding faith were off limits. In fact, I remember one time leaving church growing up and I saw a car in the parking lot. I don't know who it belonged to, but it had a bumper sticker on it. And the bumper sticker read, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, I thought, sure, the Bible is foundational to the Christian faith. I also thought, why do we believe it? What does it settle? Does it settle it for back then or for now also? How do we know it settles it? Who said it settles it? And I had these questions. I don't think I'm alone in having questions. Now, your personality determines the type of question you have. This week, our staff did a cool training on our staff retreat uh, that probably a bunch of you have done called the Myers-Briggs Personality Test. And what this does is it shows you um, multiple different ways that God has designed you to be unique. And one of the ways that God designs people in unique ways, according to this test, is everybody uh, tends to be either a thinker or a feeler in how we make decisions. Now, What it doesn't mean is it doesn't mean people who are thinkers don't have feelings and people who are feelers don't think. That's not what it means. It just means when it comes time to make a decision that feelers will say, well, this um, experience is a fact where other, the thinkers will say this logic is a fact upon which I'll make my decision. So we process things differently. But what I've realized is that if you're a thinker or feeler, you have different types of questions. If you're a thinker, your questions are probably more about theology or scripture. How do we get the Bible? How's God three in one? What's up with the virgin birth? What is inspiration of scripture? If you're a feeler, your questions are more along the lines of the pain that you feel. Why is my sick friend not getting well? God, why'd you let this happen? God, I don't understand this command. Why should I follow it? God, I've got a friend in this lifestyle that you say is wrong, but my heart bleeds for them. I don't get it. What's the deal? And whether you come at it from a logical or an emotional perspective, what happens is we all have these questions and we end up at the same place. Is this something I can really believe? So in the series, what we're trying to do is every week we're taking two things that 
at first glance seem like they couldn't fit together, but paradoxically, we see upon further examination in Scripture that they fit together quite well and will help us live a stronger faith if we put them together. Now, most weeks in this series, what we've done is take two things that at first glance most people would say are good things. Definitely all Christians would say are good things. So we've taken grace, that's a good thing, and truth, that's a good thing, we put them together. We've taken uh, solitude, good thing, taken community, put them together, that's a good thing. Today's going to be slightly different because we're going to take one thing that all Christians, and maybe even people who don't have it, would say is good, which is faith, belief, and we're going to pair it with something that all too often in Christian circles gets looked down on, questions. Today I want to talk about how do we live out a faith that has questions. Now I want to talk about faith for a second. At Mosaic we talk a lot about faith, and Acts 16 says, among many other places that say similar things, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. And we say the gospel is good news. And that's not just good news, that's great news. Because here's what it means. All you have to do to be connected to God is have faith. We say it like this. You've run your life into a ditch. You've done it on your own. It doesn't work. And in your arrogance, you've rejected God. So Jesus says, I will connect you back to my Father. I will pay the punishment for your sin. All you have to do is say, I trust you, Jesus. I believe I'm in. And you get it. You're connected back to God, and that's called faith. And that's good news. All I need is faith. I just believe. I don't have to be good enough. There's not a rule to keep. I can't earn it. I can't unearn it. It's not based on how good I am or how bad I am. It's based on how good he is, and that's it. So I choose faith. That's good. But then my mind starts racing with all these questions. And most of my questions go like, yeah, but... Yeah, I read that Jesus healed, but why not my family member? Yeah, Scripture is our foundation, but where did it come from? Yeah, faith sounds great, but my science teacher said, Yeah, Jesus saves, but what about people who've never heard? Yeah, I hear God's plan for sex, but what about him or her or all of them? And I could go on, and so could you, because we've got questions. So I'm going to let you know up front, I don't want to be a Christian, and I don't want this to be a church where questions are off limits. Because let's be honest, in church world or in faith world, sometimes you take a risk to voice a question, and it's something kind of sensitive to you, and people on purpose or inadvertently communicate, yeah, we don't ask things like that here. And here's how I believe it gets to that place, is somewhere along the line, for some reason, people connected questions to doubt and connected doubt to faithlessness and connected that to walking away from Jesus completely. So what happens in environments where questions are off limits is people either lie and say they don't have questions, or when they do, they just stay quiet, and then one day they drift away from faith because there wasn't a place for them to belong. But look at what Scripture says. You must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Another translation says, be merciful to those who doubt. Meaning, if you follow Jesus, it's okay to have questions. Meaning, if you have questions, if you have a faith that wavers, if you have doubts, if you don't understand, this is a healthy place for you to be. Because here's what Scripture is going to show us today. I'm going to tip my hand early. Here's the punchline. Healthy questions grow your faith. And what we're going to do is learn from one of Jesus' closest followers about how to have healthy questions, because a lot of us have assumed or been told that questions about faith are off limits, but scripture is going to set us free from that line of thinking today. We're going to learn from the gospel of John. It's one of the biographies about Jesus in the Bible written by his friend John. It starts off by explaining Jesus is the son of God. Then for many chapters, it tells us teachings of Jesus as well as different miracles he performed. The story culminates by explaining that Jesus was executed on a cross at the hands of the Roman government. Then on the third day, he was raised to life. Well, after he was raised to life, the first person he appeared to was one of his friends named Mary Magdalene. Mary, Mag Mary from Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Mary immediately runs to the other 11 disciples and she says, I've seen the Lord. He's alive. Now they obviously have some questions about this. But then Jesus appears to them. So they believe Jesus rose from the dead, but there's a catch. It says one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. Now, we don't know why he was called the twin. Some people speculate he looked like Jesus. We don't really know for sure. It's kind of like all nicknames. You don't really know how they started. That's just what he was called. But have you ever had an experience like Thomas where you 
miss something and everybody else in the group experienced it and you're the one who missed out. You know what I'm talking about? A few years ago, my wife and I were in New York City and let me just preface this story by saying, I am not a New York Yankees fan, okay? I want you to listen to the rest of the sermon. So you have to know, I'm not a New York Yankees fan. I bleed Chicago Cub Blue and then cheer for the Orioles on top of that. But we were going to New York City. We enjoyed going to different sporting events and we said, hey, let's go um, to this old Yankee stadium that's getting torn down the next year or so. Uh, see the Yankees play, that'll be fun, fun part of our little trip. So we got tickets, we're sitting pretty high. Uh, after a couple innings, I said, hey, I'm going to go get a drink. So I walked down the steps, went on the concourse, got in line to get a beer. The line was taking a lot longer than I thought it was going to take. Game, uh, next inning started. While I'm waiting in line for my drink, I hear a huge roar from the stands. Great, I missed something. So I get my drink, I go back in, sit down. I realize what I missed was a Derek Jeter home run. Now, even if you hate the Yankees, as you should, the, you would admit <laughs> that Derek Jeter is a pretty awesome player in spite of the colors he wears. I mean, Derek Jeter is the best Yankee in our lifetime, unbelievable player, for certain going to be in the Hall of Fame when he qualifies in a couple of years. But uh, you also have to know, if you don't know baseball, Derek Jeter wasn't like a home run hitter. I mean, he wasn't cranking home runs all the time. He had a handful of home runs a year. That wasn't really his game. But I step out for five minutes to get a stinking drink, and I come back, and during my five minutes missing the game is when Derek Jeter Hall of Famer hits a home run. Another reason to hate the Yankees, right there, right? <laughs> and I think that's what happened to Thomas. I think the guys are hanging out, grieving together about Jesus being dead. They get hungry. Thomas says, okay, I'll go get us some food. He's going down the store to get takeout. While he's gone, he comes back with dinner. And they say, hey, while you were getting us food, Jesus showed up. <laughs> Verse 25, they told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe unless I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into them. I won't believe it unless I place my hand into the wound in his side. And think about this. Thomas has gotten a bad rap over the years, like Doubting Thomas is his name. But I wouldn't have been any different. I saw my friend's tomb. Thank you very much. You all saw him alive. Okay, I'll schedule an appointment with the doctor for you this week, right? <laughs> Eight days later, the disciples were together again. <laughs> this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Now, there's disagreement. It says the doors were locked and then Jesus was there. There's disagreement um, on what that means, and we don't know for sure. Some people think Jesus used his God superpowers to just get in a locked door. Some people have speculated what we know about uh, physics and different dimensions, that Jesus' resurrected body uh, maybe could enter into a different dimension that we're not capable of, and that's how he got through a locked door. Some people have said, no, the disciples over and over proved they were dumb. They obviously didn't know how to lock a door. Jesus just walked right in is what happened. That's what some people say. <laughs> Either way, Jesus was there. Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Thomas, put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Jesus said, heard you had a question. Here's the answer. Look at Thomas's answer. My Lord and my God. I love that phrase because of each word. I love the word my because it's personal. He's saying, Jesus, you are my God. You're not someone else's God. I don't believe because someone told me to. I don't believe because my grandma believed. He's saying, I'm making a decision for myself that you are my God. When people get in our baptism tub, they say, I believe. You make the decision for yourself. Coming to church doesn't make you believe. Giving money doesn't make you believe. Belief is a decision to act as if it's true, and you decide for you. That's why we say every week, when you are ready to decide, check the baptism box in your connection card so we can talk about it. And we have a conversation with every person who checks that box to make sure you believe it, that you're not doing it for your wife, that you're not doing it for your mom, that you believe. And then the words Lord and God are important. God means you're God. You're not just a man. You're not just a good teacher. You are the creator and redeemer of the universe. But Lord means you're the God I'm going to follow. As in from this day forward, I'm going to do whatever you say for the rest of my life. Again, when we baptize people, they say, Jesus is the son of God. He's God, my Lord. Meaning I will do whatever he says from this day forward. And that's the end of the story. 
Thomas has questions. Jesus answers them. Thomas has faith. And that's it. Now, Thomas has gotten a bad reputation over the years, but I think there's a lot we should actually learn from Thomas. And the overall thing I take from this story, and we read the whole story, we read every verse, the overall thing I take from it is Jesus never bashes Thomas. He never condemns Thomas. He, says, he never says when he shows up, Thomas, I don't know why you didn't believe like the rest of these guys. He just says, here I am. Now you can believe. So I believe healthy questions grow your faith. Thomas had a greater faith at the end of the day because he asked a question that he had. So I want to talk about questions, but before we talk about questions, um, we have to have a clear understanding of what we mean when we say faith or when we say belief. And sometimes we get the words belief and wish mixed up. Believe means I'm going to act as if it's true. Wish means it'd be nice if it were true. And we get these confused. Both words want it to be true, but the difference is in how you act. Faith without deeds is dead. Faith without deeds is wishing. See, too often we confuse these. I could say, I wish I'd inherit $10 million this week. And I do wish that just in case, just so we're clear. I don't have faith that's going to happen at all. I wish it would happen, but I'm not going to act as if it will happen. I'm not going to go out this week and buy a vacation home in the Rocky Mountains and another vacation home in Miami and go out and buy two brand new cars and upgrade my house here in Maryland. I'm not going to act as if it's true that I'm going to inherit $10 million. I wish it was true, but I don't believe that. Wishing doesn't need logic. Wishing doesn't need proof. Wishing doesn't need anything. You can wish anything you want. And this is why I like Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, a dad brings his son to Jesus to heal him. Jesus says, do you believe I can heal him? And look at this verse. The father says, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. I love that because that's where I live. See, it doesn't matter if you have doubt. It doesn't matter if you have questions. What matters is do you act as if it's true? It's why John Ortberg said, disciples are not people who never doubt. They doubt and worship. They doubt and serve. They doubt and help each other with their doubts. They doubt and practice faithfulness. They doubt and wait for their doubt one day to be turned to knowing. And the important lesson of Thomas is his questions, when he was honest about them, strengthened his faith. So we learn healthy questions grow your faith. Now the key word here is healthy. Healthy questions. Have you ever heard somebody say, there's no such thing as a stupid question. The only stupid question is the one that goes unasked. You've heard that phrase? You know who disagrees with that phrase? Teachers. <laughs> Teachers disagree with that phrase. They have heard loads of stupid questions. If you look around, they're nodding right now. In fact, I was researching stupid questions, and I found this list of bizarre questions that are asked every single day of Google, and these rose to the top of the list because they're asked so often. I wanted to share them with you. I found them kind of funny. People ask Google, is it okay to pee in the ocean? Can... <laughs> Can men get pregnant? Do penguins, do penguins have knees? How many people drop their cell phone in the toilet? It's one in five. Who knew? At least two people you're sitting next to. Have, anyway. <laughs> Does farting burn calories? Am I a psycho? What are the best investment opportunities in Nigeria? And if you don't think that's funny or don't know why it's funny, for the sake of your grandchildren's inheritance, never use email again. And then the last one... <laughs> was why do men have nipples? Fair question. <laughs> Some of you are like, I'm Googling right now. So there are stupid questions. But here's what teachers will tell you. The thing that makes a question stupid is not what the question is, but how it's asked. If it's asked sarcastically or because somebody wasn't paying attention, that's a stupid question. If there's an honest, humble question, it doesn't matter the content of it. A teacher loves to answer that type of question. So I want to use Thomas's example and show you, when we have questions about faith, the difference between healthy questions and bad questions. And if you are someone who never doubts and never has questions, then I'll ask you to not take notes for the rest of this. But if you ever have a question, if you've had, ever had a struggle with faith, if you have a friend even 
who has really deep, important questions about faith, I'd encourage you to write down this list, even take a picture of it as it's complete, because I think God wants to use this to strengthen your faith. Here's the first difference. Healthy questions are curious. Bad questions are cynical. Curious versus cynical. I love that Thomas focused on, did Jesus rise from the dead? He didn't get cynical. He didn't get mean. He wasn't rude to the other guys when they said, hey, we saw Jesus. He just said, I know, if Jesus rose from the dead, every other question will take care of itself. Curiosity is a great thing. Albert Einstein once said, I never want to lose a holy curiosity. I love that. You know who knows what curious questions are? Parents of toddlers. Yes, sympathetic groan from the crowd. Right? The average toddler asks 200 questions every single day. What's for dinner? Where'd that come from? Why'd you go to the bathroom? What'd you do in the bathroom? How long were you in there? What'd you play on your phone? Why can't I come to the bathroom for you, with you? Why do we wear clothes? Where does Elmo live? Where does grass come from? And it goes on and on and on. And the only thing that keeps you from going insane and not strangling the toddler asking all these questions is you know they're not being cynical. They're genuinely curious. So you can be patient with them. Curious questions grow your faith. I have a, just a personal rule. I don't spend time with cynical people. And it doesn't matter, Christian, non-Christian, whatever. I don't, I don't care. If you're cynical, I don't want to spend time with you. Because your goal is not to help me. Your goal is just to tear down and be mean and be destructive. But I'll sit with somebody who's curious all day long because curious people strengthen my faith. Curiosity makes you wonder, what does the Bible say about that? And you go study it. Curiosity says, I wonder what God would do if I prayed for this. And then you pray it every day. Curiosity asks, does science really contradict the Bible? And you go study for yourself. Curiosity says, what would happen if I did this as a step of faith? And then you go take the step. And then what happens is your faith grows because you're curious, not cynical. Healthy questions are asking Bad questions are demanding. I like that in the story, Thomas didn't demand it's got to happen on Tuesday by 12 o'clock in this way, or I'm not believing Jesus ever again. All he said was he asked. He said, I need to see him. I need to see the scars. See, good questions are asking. Bad questions are demanding. One is asking an honest, logical question. The other is saying, you have to do this. One is saying, how are you going to do this? The other says, you're going to do it my way. I'll give you an example. The month of June, selfishly, is a pretty awesome month for me because I enjoy getting gifts. And in the month of June, uh, over the course of 15 days, is my wedding anniversary, Father's Day, and my birthday, all in the course of, of just two weeks. So uh, we're into gift giving. And sometimes we'll do something like no gifts and go out to eat or something like that. But most of the time we give gifts for holidays like that. So I realized this was coming up and I needed to plant a suggestion with my wife, right? So there's two ways to do that. I could ask my wife, and I could say, hey, babe, if you're getting me something this year, and if, you know, you plan some fun dinner instead, that's cool too, uh, but if you get me something, I'd love to get some new workout gear, both for running and lifting weights, and I could ask that. But if I demanded, I could go to her and say this, hey, Lindsay, there's three days this month, I'm expecting gifts, I want new workout gear, I want black running shorts from Nike, not the Walmart brand, get a large shirt and not a medium, if you get me something that doesn't match, I'm not even going to try it on, and if anything doesn't fit, you're taking it back, not me. <laughs> what do you think's going to happen if I demand? I ain't getting any. No, I mean, I'm not getting any, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> So let me uh, stay with me. Uh, I have a serious point. Let's just imagine that you have a friend who's sick, mentally or physically, and you love that person. And you heard, you've heard that God has the power to heal. If you love that person, you will pray for God to heal that person. But how will you do it? You can demand. And you can say, God, I cannot believe in you if you do not heal them. In which case, you've already determined the way your heart's going. Or you can ask. 
which would sound like this. God, I want this person to get well, and I love them, and I know you love them, and I know you can heal them, and God, I won't understand if you don't heal them, but God, I will follow you either way at the end of the day, but, but God, will you please heal them? One asks, one demands. And when you think about it, the demand is probably going to have you walk away from God at the end of the day anyway. But the ask, even if God says no, will actually strengthen your faith because you will be forced to depend on him even more. Healthy questions ask. Bad questions demand. Healthy questions are personal. Bad questions are generic. I love that Thomas didn't come up with something generic. Like when they said, we saw Jesus, he didn't say, well, uh, when he gets back, I've been wanting to ask him about why Job in the Old Testament suffered so much. He didn't ask some generic question. He made it personal. He said, for me, I need to see the scars. See, good questions are about you. They're personal. I'll tell you a pet peeve of mine, kind of is when I get this one question, and I, the, the pet peeve is, is it's a fair question. My pet peeve is I don't think people really honestly had this question. I think they use this question to deflect the honest question that they really have that they don't want to talk about. But people will come to me and people will come to you and they'll say, uh, I can't accept Jesus as the only way to God because what about those who've never heard? And it's a fair question. In fact, it's so fair that we've done multiple sermons on it and we've done sermons on many of your other questions as well. So go listen to the podcast and you'll hear a scriptural answer. But the reason I don't like it is because most of the time it seems like people don't really care about that question. They're just hiding the real question, so they're using that as a front. So I just want to point out, hey, God is God. He's thought about that a whole lot more than you have. I'm pretty sure he loves the person you're talking about more than you do, and so I think he's going to take care of that. But let's deal with your real question. Because I think... My opinion, the reason we ask generic questions is we don't want to deal with the pain of the personal questions. Because when we ask a generic question, it's to cover the personal question. So you have pain in your life, and you'll ask some question about the Bible's being interpreted wrong, and you don't really care about that at all. You're just not willing to ask the question of, why is God letting this happen to me? Because it hurts. But when you take the risk to ask, is when you make it possible to find the answer. Jesus said, seek and you will find. So if you have a personal struggle, voice it. Ask it to God. Ask it to other believers and say, I don't know what to do with this. But here's my question. And just see what happens. Last one. Write it down. Take a picture. Healthy questions are seeking. Bad questions are passive. In our story, Thomas was with the disciples. He said, okay, Jesus is back. I need to see it. So I'm going to hang out in the place where Jesus showed up. He doesn't say, okay, I need to see it. So I'm going fishing. Uh, come get me if he shows back up again. He's seeking. He's not passive. Bad questions are passive. Have you ever talked to somebody about something you like and they say, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that movie. I don't like that kind of food. And you're kind of taken aback. But then you find out in the course of the conversation, they've never actually tried it. Like they've never tried that food or they've never tried to watch that movie. And you're thinking, Wait, that's not okay. Like, let me, let, me, let me just make an announcement on behalf of humanity. You are not allowed to have an opinion on your taste in something if you've never tasted it. Okay? That's just a rule for all of us going forward. You can't, it's not, <laughs> it's not okay to say you don't like something if you haven't tried it. It's not okay to do that with a restaurant. It's not okay to do that with a certain uh, comedic movie. You can't do that with, well, you can do it with country music, but you can't do it with anything else where you say, <laughs> you can't try it, because what if you liked it? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my question. Do you seek or are you passive? Do you be open with other people and say, here's my struggle? Let me talk to two groups specifically. There's some of you here who, if I talk to you in the lobby, uh, you'd say, well, you know, Mosaic's not my church. I'm figuring out if Mosaic's going to be my church. Okay, that's fair. Um, let me say this from my perspective. If you've been here more than once, Mosaic's your church. <laughs> but let me go a step farther. They're clapping because they want you. Um, <laughs> Let me go a step farther and say this. You need to get involved. 
Join a serving team, connect in a group, get to know other people where you don't just anonymously slip in and sit in the back row, you know, and, and get out of here during the last song and don't know anybody. Experience the fullness of the church. Say, hey, I, I, I'm kind of new. I'm going to lead one of those impact teams. Why not? And you would say, well, Mosaic's not my church, so I don't want to get involved until I know it's my church. No, 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 you got it backwards. You get involved to figure out if it is going to be your church. And, and just so we're clear, um, our serving teams are good. We just united the campuses. We don't need, like, more volunteers. We'll make room for you because we want you to serve. But we don't, this isn't some kind of plea for that. And when you join a group, like, I don't even know the exact people who join a group. I'm going to sleep tonight the same whether you join a group or not. This is not about anything that changes in my life. This is about what changes in your life. If Mosaic isn't your church, that's fair, but at least give it a shot. And then on a much more important and deeper level, a bunch of you here would say, I'm just investigating Jesus. Like, he is not my God. He's not my Lord. I'm, I'm figuring it out. Okay, great. We're glad you're here. We, we create this environment in part for you. But I have a challenge for you. If you're investigating Jesus, you need to be reading a chapter of his biographies every single day. And you need to be praying every single day a very simple prayer that goes like this. God, if you're there, will you help me find you? And you say, well, I don't, I don't believe in Jesus, so I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm not going to pray until I know I believe in Jesus. No, 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 you have it backwards. Because it's only by seeking him that you could possibly find him. So learn his teachings. Learn his story. See what he has to say to you. Just put prayer to the test and see if God won't meet you where you are and you will find him. And at least at the end of the day, if you walk away from Jesus, you can say, I gave it a fair shot. Don't seek passively. Truly seek him, which is active. One more scripture. The last time Jesus' big group of disciples is with him, Here's what it says. When they, the disciples, saw him, Jesus, they worshiped him. That makes sense. He rose from the grave. I'll worship you. But some of them doubted. What a weird phrase. I mean, he's right there. <laughs> like, he's in front of them, but some of them are doubting. Here's what this tells me. Everybody's going to have questions. So, we will be patient with those who doubt. We will be patient with those who ask questions. This must be a place where we can ask healthy questions. Now, if you want to be cynical, I, I don't have time for that. If you're just trying to tear me down. But if you're curious, if you're asking honest, humble, healthy questions, we will sit with you all day as we struggle together through those questions. One of the reasons we stand in the lobby after every sermon is people come up to us with questions. Hey, I don't understand this. I'm struggling with this. Okay, let's chat. Because healthy questions grow your faith. Now, here's why this topic is so important to me, is it's personal. Because there's some times where, if I'm honest, I think 51% of me believes. I'm not proud of that. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying it's a real thing. And it's why I like Thomas, because he had questions which I can relate to. But on the days I doubt, I choose to act as if it's true, which means acting like Thomas. It means seeking Jesus and putting myself around other people who are following him. And today's topic is another reason I need Christians in my life. A lot of the time when I hang out with my closest Christian friends, we just ask questions. Hey, what should I do with this? What do you think of that? And a lot of the time our answers to each other are, I don't know. But we help each other lean on Jesus. And that gives us faith. And that results in hope. So I don't know what questions you have. Maybe it's an intellectual question. Maybe it's an emotional question. But I do know Jesus can handle it. Jesus can stand up to your scrutiny. And I believe if you bring him your question, he'll answer it. Maybe not how you want, but he'll answer it. And it'll increase your faith, and you will have real hope. Because following Jesus and the promises of Jesus are not something we wish for. It's something we believe. And whatever questions you have, bring them to Jesus. 
because he can handle it. Let's pray together. Jesus, that opening song that our band sang is, describes how a lot of us feel with faith sometimes. We're just discombobulated. We, we can't catch our balance and, and just even stand up straight and walk the right direction. So thank you that scripture teaches we can bring our questions to you. That faith and questions can go together and help each other out. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Something we do every week at Mosaic is celebrate communion. We're going to do that right now. We're going to pass a tray down your row with stacks of cups on it. We want you to take a stack of cups. There will be a cracker in one, juice in the other that represent the body and blood of Jesus. While our band's playing, we want you to eat and drink that to be reminded that Jesus gave up his body and blood for you when he died on the cross so you could have grace. And all you have to do is believe in him and you're washed clean and made new. And that's good news. While we celebrate communion, I want you to meditate on Psalm 94 that says this. I cried out, I'm slipping. But your unfailing love, O oh Lord, supported me. When doubts filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. And so I get that you have questions. I get that you have doubts, but Jesus rose. He was seen, so our hope is real. So let him right now renew your hope and joy as we celebrate communion together.